It's my pleasure to in, uh, welcome Joshua Keating, a prolific author and one who you can read regularly on Slate. He uh, churns out the columns on a regular basis and uh, is always looking at uh, foreign policy with an interesting angle and a different twist. Um, but he's here tonight because he's written this new book, Invisible Countries, Journeys to the Edge of Nationhood. And it is a, a part travelogue, part thought experiment, part history of geography, and a look at really what makes up nations, countries, states, and these are all different things. Um, but uh, Joshua, you know, uh, I think this is true for you as well. My grandfather uh, was born in a country that no longer exists, actually in an empire. He was brought up in the Ottoman Empire. Um, he was a subject. And um, my father was then born and raised in a country that grew out of the Ottoman Empire in Greece, and I was born and raised in the United States. So um, I, it is, uh, and it's not that long ago, I'm talking about a gener you know, two generations. So in two generations, in my family alone, we are looking at a country that didn't exist <laughs> in its entirety, a country that, or an empire that fell apart, and a, a fairly uh, new country, but an old democracy. Um, this is, I think, also partly uh, true for you and your family and, and how, uh, and your background. And, and maybe if you talk a bit about your background and how you came to writing this particular book and maybe relate those two things. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I talk a bit uh, in the book at the end about my grandfather who, uh, if you ask them where he was from, he would just tell you the Bronx, which <laughs> wasn't really what people were asking. It is another um, country. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but we'd always assumed he was from Poland, uh, and when we looked into it, he was actually born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, the town he was from was invaded by the Nazis, and uh, and it was part of and it was part of independent Poland at the time he left. Later, became part of the Soviet Union, and now it's actually in uh, uh, independent Ukraine. It's part. Of, it's uh, near Lviv. Um, so and. You know, there are plenty of towns like that uh, all over the world, and I, and I, really, what, how that relates to the book is what I'm interested in is why the world, the map of the world, uh, that we see today has become relatively fixed and unchanging. How, uh, at least in this century, we've seen uh, the creation of relatively few countries. Uh, when there are armed conflicts, they tend not to be between states and they tend not to end with borders being redrawn. And so I was interested in looking at, uh, one, at how we ended up with this map that uh, now seems so difficult to change, and two, uh, whether there are any prospects for this age of cartographical stasis, which is what I call it, uh, coming to an end. Uh, and so do you have a conclusion? Is it coming to an end? I mean, when you, when you think about it, certainly when you think about it in the United States, you often think about the map in your elementary uh, school classroom. And for mm -hmm. me and others, uh, that has changed dramatically because there used to be a big red spot on it that made up uh, uh, the largest uh, single country uh, in, uh, in, on that map. Um, and that wasn't that long ago either. Right. So are we destined to sort of reformulate, uh, rejigger this map? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, at the time I started working on the book, it seemed like there was kind of new pressure on the map uh, in several areas. There was, uh, so it was around 2014, so there was shortly after Russia's annexation of Crimea, which has uh, been in the news again uh, recently. Uh, it was the emergence of ISIS, uh, which was sort of devoted, uh, proclaim the goal of destroying the Sykes-Picot borders in the Middle East, the colonial era, bo era borders. Uh, in the South China Sea, we saw China building these artificial islands in order to kind of build out its territorial claims there. So um, it seemed like, and, uh, and the, there was Brexit as well, which was kind of a, um, uh, maybe not, a creation of a new country or a redrawing of borders, but a kind of reassertion of national sovereignty. So it seemed at the time like it, uh, this era of stasis might be coming to an end, but you know, now at the end of this process, it's sort of looking a little less likely. I mean, a, a, if you look around the world, there's um, at uh, 
most of the armed conflicts and political conflicts. I mean, it's uh, the prospects for the creation of new states or for major territorial adjustments are looking uh, pretty slim, I have to say. There are some instances where uh, there is an attempt to geographically change, I mean physically change. Uh, you mentioned the South China Sea and the mm -hmm. building up of, uh, of features into islands. Uh, I recently heard that there was even the potential of creating a canal around Qatar <laughs> to actually uh, turn it into an island. Yeah, yeah, it's if it's sort of uh, taking the uh, um, diplomatic isolation of Qatar to uh, a kind of absurd ex extreme, uh, building this canal to reinforce the border. Um, one of the play, I mean, it, there's a large section of the book is about climate change and the impact of sea level rise on small island states. And one of the places I went to uh, is a place called Kiribati in the Central Pacific, which is actually a UN member state, a uh, widely recognized country. But um, if projections uh, are borne out, uh, may not be habitable um, in the decades to come as uh, sea levels rise and um, you know getting access to fresh water becomes an issue. And their former president, Anote Tong, kind of became internationally known for talking about this issue and and even for talking about the prospect of relocating the entire population of Kiribati to um, either to you know another island or uh, or to a mainland country and I, what I was sort of interested in there was the question of whether a country can continue to exist as a political entity if the physical territory that it's associated with, no longer exists. So our general definition of a country is it has to have uh, a government and a population, yes, but most of all, it has to be a piece of land that's divided from other countries, either by you know physical boundaries or by politically drawn boundaries. And, uh, and so the idea of a kind of uh, Kiribati continuing to exist as a country and uh, continuing to have citizens and a government if the, those islands don't exist. I think it's going to, um, as the uh, officials there say they'd like to do, uh, it's going to require a kind of rethinking of uh, how we've come to define uh, countries or nation states. And within the book, you also talk about um, recognition as uh, having some relationship to the United Nations and whether it is also something that has a flag hanging outside of uh, that large structure in New York City. Mm -hmm. Are there other uh, aspects that sort of define a, a country? Well, the, uh, the United Nations has become, UN membership has become a kind of gold standard for uh, national legitimacy, but you know a lot of the places I went to are semi-recognized, um, or and so for instance, uh, you know Somaliland, which is a place I visited, which is um, at least according to the rest of the world, the northern portion of Somalia, uh, is uh, has its own government, uh, has sort of defined boundaries, although there's some dispute over them. Uh, the people there consider themselves not citizens of Somalia, but citizens of Somaliland. Uh, the government actually enters into contracts with, uh, with private companies that are interested in, you know, whether build, redeveloping the port or uh, drilling for oil. So it behaves as a political sovereign, even though uh, not a single other government in the world uh, recognizes it. And so that, that's a kind of extreme example. Uh, and then there are kind of better known cases, uh, you have places like Taiwan, um, which is de facto independent, though not formally recognized by most countries. Uh, Palestine, of course, uh, and you know there, there are other examples, but I, I was sort of interested in some of the uh, uh, the lesser known ones. Right. So uh, you know you often hear the term stateless or nation, right, where there are peoples who like these. Uh, this example in the mm -hmm. Pacific, uh, where they no longer have territory, uh, but do have some standing within the United Nations, for example, mm. um, but are also maybe looking for uh, 
territory to occupy and, uh, and recognition uh, in a broader sense within this international community. Uh, do you even use that term, international community, as you look at these uh, I think uh, so. countries? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, one, I, another of the kind of main places that I talk about in the book is Kurdistan, uh, where I traveled in the summer of 2016. Uh, at the time, they're sort of gearing up for this long anticipated uh, referendum on independence. Um, the referendum took place, you know, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan has been kind of de facto independent uh, since the early 90s and um, uh, has a significant amount of support, uh, particularly from the United States and uh, also from a uh, number of other Western countries. Uh, but that said, there, there are limits to that support and it always seems to stop just short of uh, full independence. I mean, they uh, were, were happy to uh, enlist the help of the Kurds in fighting ISIS, but it, you know, it, their sort of attempts to translate that into support for independence from Iraq um, uh, never quite comes to fruition. And since I went to Kurdistan, they held the referendum. Uh, there was overwhelming support for independence. Uh, and they were hoping this would sort of lead to sort of groundswell of support for them, which would help in negotiations with Baghdad, but it didn't work out that way at all. Um, the Iraqi government, uh, and with the support of uh, Shiite militias, quickly came in and reoccupied some of the disputed areas um, and uh, uh, reasserted central government control. They were blockaded with the help of Turkey and Iran, and uh, the U.S. kind of shrugged uh and uh and now in in a lot of ways uh uh iraqi kurdistan def has less territory and somewhat less autonomy than it did uh before it held that referendum which could be taken as a cautionary tale for other places that enjoy this kind of in-between status um that uh when they try to make it official sometimes the backlash can be pretty harsh. Right, and you talk about a few more of these places like Abkhazia, which is mm -hmm. right, uh, abutting or a part of Georgia, depending on who you're asking. And of course, you, you went there as well. Maybe we could talk about that a bit. But you know, you were just talking about how uh, a people uh, or an ethnicity or a grouping in some ways decides that it's looking for autonomy and uh, to express sort of a national uh, sovereign state. But um, sometimes, or oftentimes, I guess, if we look at, uh, at the 19th and 20th century, that's an imposition by others. In other words, um, there is the, for instance, I'll use the most recent example, and it, in it includes Kurdistan, since you just mm -hmm. mentioned this. We were talking uh, not too long ago about the so-called Biden plan for Iraq, mm -hmm. where uh, the uh, belief uh, and the assertion was that if you were able to break Iraq up into three uh, constituent pieces of a Shia Iraq, a Sunni Iraq, and a Kurdish Iraq, that that would somehow create a more peaceful environment and, uh, and, and, and the uh, ability of these independent uh, ethnicities or religions to f uh, express themselves nationally. Um, so, so on the one hand, as I was saying, it's this national movement or people's uh, desire, and on the other, and there are examples of certainly not just Iraq where it is an imposed or, or an asserted uh, type of nationality. Yeah, and, it, and I think that's something that my thinking changed a bit on as I was writing the book. I mean, I, I think I used to be a little more sympathetic to arguments like that, that, oh, a lot of these borders are, you know, artificial colonial constructs and uh, things would be much better off if we could just uh, redraw them to... Uh, correspond with uh, the kind of ethnic or national realities on the ground, and that would, you know, help things out in in the Middle East or in Africa. And I, uh, I think, it, especially traveling to to Kurdistan and and also to Somaliland to an extent, uh, I I'm somewhat more skeptical of those arguments that uh, sort of redrawing the lines uh, is really the solution. Uh, to a lot of these problems. I think that uh, uh, if you look in history, the examples, there are relatively few examples of peaceful 
democratic transition uh, partitions. Uh, you know, for all the Czechoslovakia's right, the velvet rev velvet divorce. Yeah, w so. which which was never actually voted on. Right. As, as it, that, um, but you know, it, at, as they go, uh, yes. not a bad one. Um, you know the uh, examples like Yugoslavia, like the partition of India, where um, partitions are preludes to border conflicts and ethnic cleansing of uh, are a lot more common. And often that's because peoples don't tend to group themselves in these neat little units that you can draw lines around. Uh, most of the time when you draw a border, uh, someone's going to end up on the wrong side of it. And, uh, you know, it can also often create just as many problems as it solves. Right. So if you were king of the world, you would not bring out your ruler and map and, and start carving up the states and these <laughs> ethnic or national uh, entities. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's like something that uh, a lot of people ask me about the book, but I, I'm sort of careful uh, in most of these cases, not to take sides on any of these disputes, mainly because I think the uh, track record of foreigners coming in and redrawing other people's borders uh, uh, has historically not been that great. And uh, I don't want to just kind of add to, uh, um, to a kind of dismal um, historical track record. So you're not willing to weigh in on the three California concept and whether we should have three Californians. I'm going to defer to the locals and to the, uh, 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 you know, investigate the facts on the ground before I... Uh, um, you know, in the book, one of the things that, because you're basically, again, you sort of have to imagine and you talk about this as cartographic stasis. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that means a map that doesn't change in mm -hmm. essence. It is the lines we know are pretty much stable with some fluctuations the ones, some of the ones that you've mentioned, either because of natural sea level rise yeah. or um, volcanic growth. Uh, we have some new territory in Hawaii, for instance. Um, but um, there is also uh, this question of how do we look at the areas that are, uh, and this is really the focus of your book, are these areas that are harder to define, that aren't nations. What, what do we think about uh, and when you look at, say, Antarctica or in the Arctic region, I know that the, there are different ways of characterizing those, but what mm. is it? How do you look at them as someone who really cares about the map and looks at how nations fight over territory? Uh, well, I mean, in a lot of ways, one of the most interesting places I went to was uh, the one that was closest to home, which is a Mohawk territory called Aquasasne, which is uh, on the US Canada border. It's roughly where. Ontario, Quebec, and New York State meet um, about a two-hour drive from Syracuse. And uh, this is a place that's not really in Canada or the US. It's just kind of its own uh, place. But it sort of has borders imposed on it uh, because the US and Canada have different uh, legal regimes for recognizing uh, indigenous nations. It means that Akwesasne, this pretty tiny town, has to have two different governments, one recognized by each country, even though when you're in the town, there's no border. Uh, someone pointed out to me, the only way you know if you're in the US or in Canada is the color of the fire hydrants. If you're, if you're in the US, they're red fire hydrants. If you're in Canada, they're yellow. Um, and so that was this kind of fascinating place to me. And, and you know, often to get from one part of town to the other, uh, it involves crossing an international border sometimes twice. You have to go from Canada into the U.S. and then back around because of the way uh, the river curves. And uh, so the border is this real kind of daily, almost invasive presence in people's lives, and it's something they have to uh, uh, contend with, um, you know, uh, every day. Even though, to another extent, it's a place where the U.S.-Canada border doesn't exist. So. Uh, I found that sort of fascinating, especially at a time when, um, you know, s the notion of strongly defining and defending our borders is very much uh, in the news and, and um, a topic uh, that we hear a lot about that, you know, often uh, things are a little more ambiguous than they appear. Right. So even though on the one hand, uh, a big part of the political discourse not only in the United States, but in Central Europe and elsewhere, is really how do you uh, f 
fix those borders with mm -hmm. physical infrastructure that actually defines in a very distinct way uh, where the country begins and where it ends, uh, and making sure that using that physical boundary is a filtering tool for whom you allow in as well. Well, on the other hand, what we're also seeing is that in almost every home, there are these tools that we have that are connected to this interwebs, the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the internet that, that creates almost a Siberian with the word being spelled C-Y-B-E-R, mm. um, reality, where there is actually no concept of or border uh, of, of a state. Um, I bring that latter example up because there are countries, and, and I happen to be at the Hoover Institution with um, President Ilves, the former mm. president of Estonia, and they've created e-passports and e-residency, um, something that I can actually apply for as a member. Uh, you have one? <laughs> yeah, I have well, one. Well, <laughs> why don't you tell us a bit about this? Because it really, uh, you know, on the one hand, as I say, you have this very clear, distinct um, physical uh, desire by an electorate and a leadership. And on the other hand, this thing that you're pulling out of your wallet, this little blue card, plasticized <laughs> card with a chip in it, that says you are Estonian. Uh, yeah, I should note, I have never been to the physical country of Estonia. Um, I uh, can't really say I know that much about it, to be honest, but I, <laughs> but I am a now a proud digital e-resident of the nation of Estonia. Uh, I, I've yet to entirely figure out what I can do with this, but, um, <laughs> but one of these days, I'm sure it's gonna come in handy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, what they are um, just sort of beginning to figure out is, and what interested me about it and why I wrote about it is it's kind of a, uh, um, as I was talking about before with Kiribati, a kind of alternate model of citizenship that's not necessarily tied to a physical country, that you can be a, uh, a resident of Estonia uh, not actually being in that country or uh, even ever having been there. Um, y you know, I, I think that uh, it's another thing that it, that has kind of, I think, changed over the years I've been working on the book is I, uh, I think one idea I had starting out was that while borders were remaining fixed and while it was becoming more difficult to change them, that um, they were also becoming less relevant that, um, uh, because of movements of information and capital and people that, um, you know, it, it would just uh, sort of start to matter less. But I think uh, particularly in Europe, um, since the kind of peak of the refugee crisis and the um, movement we've seen, even in the last few months to impose um, stronger border controls and uh, sort of reverse some of the movement towards uh, 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 passport free travel within the European Union and obviously um, uh, the uh, process of uh, Great Britain leaving the European Union. I think that uh, we're starting to see a kind of uh, reassertion of a more kind of fixed traditional uh, view of, of borders and uh, people uh, wanting kind of a uh, wanting them to be sort of strong, real uh, physical boundaries and not just kind of um, uh, these virtual ones that we can skip over with our digital identity cards. And, but, and it's not just these identities that are, and, and borders that are getting fixed. There seems to be almost the question of nationality as well. And you're seeing this politically, you know, whether it's in Hungary or the United States, this concept of what it is that defines that nationality. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'd, I'd lived in Hungary. Uh, my wife was the form, is the former U.S. ambassador there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are, have a very strong sense of nation and of national identity. They have a language that's like no other language mm -hmm. on earth. And so it's quite easy to define linguistically who a Hungarian is. But they uh, imagine uh, their nation uh, expanding beyond the current borders of the current Hungarian borders into Ro Romania, where there's a significant um, Hungarian-speaking population in the Transylvanian region, mm -hmm. into, Slo into Slovakia next door, where again on the border region there's a large Hungarian-speaking population. And of course, we, you already mentioned um, Crimea and the large Russian-speaking population that justified the um, 
the occupation and then eventually the usurpation yeah. of the nation through a rigged vote um, or an open vote, depending on how you how you see what happened in Crimea. Could you talk a little bit about the, the political uh, reality of you know, fixed borders and, and, and if they really are going to stay, remain fixed, or if there's going to be pressure to actually expand those as a result of those conflicting realities? Yeah, I mean, I should note the kind of period I'm talking about where borders have remained uh, relatively fixed has also been, uh, you know, a, a relatively peaceful one, which which feels like an odd thing to say, given, um, you know, um, uh, the brutal conflicts we see in Syria and Yemen and Central African Republic and elsewhere. But, I mean, there has been a uh, marked decline in interstate war in um, in countries going to war with each other. And, um, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, international boundaries have remained unquestioned, uh, or not unquestioned, but um, that, uh, that questions of control of territory have been less sort of salient international politics is connected to that, I think. And so uh, I think there are uh, the reasons why existing national governments are resistant to see changes in the world map and to see a kind of um, return to the normalization of territorial adjustments, uh, I think it's somewhat rational. I think it makes some sense that there's uh, a wariness about doing that. And it's, um, and as you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the notion of, I mean, I talked earlier about how where, wherever you draw lines, some people are going to be find themselves on the wrong side of it. And that's been used as a pretext uh, for territorial expansion for centuries. I mean, you know, uh, and, and, you know, looking at the Sudeten Germans in the uh, run up to World War II, or more recently, the annexation of Crimea. And it was um, a little strange, uh, according to uh, some reporting uh, a few weeks ago, to see uh, uh, President Trump more or less kind of endorse that argument that because uh, people in Crimea are Russian speaking, that it's just sort of natural that uh, Crimea should be part of Russia. And, uh, you know, the, there are kind of restive minority groups all over the world and, and territorial disputes everywhere. And uh, uh, the kind of notion that you can post facto justify an annexation by saying that uh, um, uh, now the borders correspond with uh, the national realities on the ground, I think is is a pretty dangerous idea and uh, kind of is an invitation to uh, more conflict of that type. So do you then think that Crimea really has opened up this Pandora's box? Because it, it seems as if it was an exceptional, in part because it was a great power that had uh, had made this move, you know, you usually, or at least usually, as we talk about this modern era of fixed maps of cartographic stasis, we, we really look at the great powers as being the ones most respectful of sovereignty, as uh, almost the, the means by which they operate and, and, and maintain a world order. And for one of the great powers, in Crimea, and actually the, uh, another great power in the South China Sea, mm. to be asserting uh, that in fact, no, these are not these these rules are not adhering to us. I mean, the United States, do we are we doing it anywhere? Is there any place that we're actually <laughs> coveting right now or looking to expand towards? It's sort of interesting. I mean, there, there's a speech I talk about in the book that President Obama gave um, uh, in, I believe it was 2014, about Crimea. And he was he was responding to Putin's argument, um, which was basically uh, a cl kind of classic Russian whataboutist argument that uh, um, the U.S. does this too. Look at the invasion of Iraq, and you know President Obama was obviously not a supporter of that war, but he was drawing a distinction between it, saying, "Yeah, yes, we invaded Iraq, and I didn't support that, but you know we didn't." conquer Iraq, like the, the government existed. And, and at the time, at least we, we pulled our troops out when we were done. Now, now U.S. troops are back, but, <laughs> um, but it, it is, that is a kind of, uh, feature of the U.S. as a superpower is that it, um, it will, uh, send troops into other countries. Sometimes it will overthrow those governments, but it will always, 
uh, at least kind of maintain the pretext that those are uh, independent states and not uh, now U.S. territory. So that's that's kind of a distinction that uh, right. the U.S. has drawn, and you can um, question whether that's hypocritical or not. Uh, I think that um, as for the Crimea case, I, I, I agree with you. I think that a lot of things do make that exceptional. Uh, it kind of happened at a sort of strange moment where the government of Ukraine was in chaos and uh, the kind of opportunity presented itself for uh, Russia to strike back against what it saw as a Western imposed overthrow of the Ukrainian government. So I, I, it'd be surprising to see sort of more kind of direct annexations of that type. But you do see some um, uh, other moves. I mean, you talked about the South China Sea, but there's also um, China's moves to kind of uh, uh, officially assert its control over Taiwan, too. I mean, not just um, pressuring governments to reverse their recognition of Taiwan, but even pressuring, you know, airlines and clothing companies to, uh, you know, not to show Taiwan as part of uh, the People's Republic of China on their maps. So that's um, uh, so that that's kind of another example, I'd say, of uh, uh, a superpower, in this case, a rising superpower trying to kind of um, uh, impose its um, vision of the world map. Right. And if we were doing it in a legal sense, we'd say going from a de facto, trying to create a de facto reality and moving it into a de jure, a legal yes. reality yeah. uh, over time. And, and it's fascinating. So what we do here at World Affairs is we take questions from the audience, and I've got a stack of blue cards in front of me. And um, I, I'll start with the first one here from Alex, who says, the way we define states presently is obviously problematic. Well, we, we've seen that there are certainly questions about it. Uh, in your research, in your writing of this book, Invisible Countries, did you come up with a better way of defining countries? <laughs> uh, it's funny. The original title of the book was going to be What is a Country? That was the um, uh, working title I worked on. And uh, my publisher kind of talked me out of it eventually, maybe because I didn't come up with a good answer. At the end of it, it would have been uh, kind of false advertising. I mean, I, I looked through... A few definitions. There's there's the kind of uh, um, international the the one under international law. There's a treaty called the Montevideo Convention mm -hmm. that gets kind of thrown around as as a definition of a state. It's something that has a government, um, a fixed territory, uh, permanent citizens, and the capacity to enter into relations with other states. And everywhere, it's funny. It's kind of an obscure. Um, uh, treaty in the U.S., but every one of these disputed territories I went to, they would like trot out the Montevideo Convention to me and argue <laughs> for like why they uh, met the criteria. And then, you know, I, I talk about uh, Max Weber, the um, German sociologist, had a famous definition of the state. It's the entity that controls the monopoly of the use of force mm -hmm. over a given territory. Uh, and, and that's become a kind of uh, go-to political science definition. Um, you know, in both those cases, there are places that meet them, but uh, aren't recognized as states. There are places, you know, Somalia, Syria, where uh, that don't quite meet those criteria, but are, you know, do have that placard at the UN General Assembly. So, um, you know, there's one, there's an author called our definition of sovereignty organized hypocrisy. And I um, I think that uh, is pretty much applicable. And, and, and I guess, you know, ra rather than trying to define a country, I mean, what I uh, came away, what I hope readers come away uh, from the book with is an idea that it's, uh, there's not really one definition. And, and uh, what I'd kind of urge people to do is to try and like, be a little more open minded and think more creatively about what a country is or, or can be. So there can be a country of Marcos Kunalakis, if that's uh, <laughs> where, if I were able to put together enough people who believed in me being a leader, that would uh, that would be a potential. Is that <laughs> when you think when I you mean, say be creative about this? I mean, are you talking about different era, different things that we would organize around? Uh, different conceptual sort of frameworks for for how we define a country. So, Could it I be mean, around Bitcoin? Yeah, well, yeah, that, 
funny enough, I mean, one of the places I went to, well, no, I didn't go there, but uh, one, some of the people I talked to is this strange little uh, community of libertarians called Liberland who've claimed a, uh, it, it's an unclaimed patch of territory between Croatia and Serbia that neither country wants for <laughs> complicated reasons. But these uh, libertarian activists have actually went and planted a flag there a few years ago and declared it the Free Republic of Liberland. And uh, they've, they've been try kind of trying to build, um, uh, and they're very into Bitcoin and blockchain, and uh, uh, that, as you would expect. Uh, but I, and the, the kind of framing device I use for the book is uh, the soccer tournament that was in Abkhazia in 2016, and uh, the World Cup just happened. But this is the, they call it the World Football Cup, and it's the World Cup for countries that can't get into FIFA. So it's uh, Somaliland and Kurdistan and Northern Cyprus and all these places uh, play in this thing called Kanifa, which is the FIFA, the sort of the independent FIFA. Uh, and it, it was a kind of, and the, there some of them were unrecognized states. Some of them, there was a team for the uh, Hungarian minority in Romania. They, right. they uh, had their own squad there. So um, I guess that was uh, a kind of fascinating place to see uh, how different, different people kind of uh, have visions of nationalism, some of which uh, do or don't correspond to, you know, actually wanting uh, to have one of these flags, you know. Right. You know, uh, there was a book a few years ago called, by Franklin Four, I think it was, How mm -hmm. Soccer uh, Defines the World, isn't that yeah. right? Something along those lines. And it seems like your book actually uses this framing device to talk about how soccer deconstructs the world. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, it's a good bookend to that uh, particular tome. Um, uh, one more question here on the uh, from the audience is, do you think more countries will go the route of e-residency like Estonia? Um, yeah, I, w I would ex expect so. I mean, I, I think it, it sort of makes sense uh, in terms of uh, attracting investment and, and clearly the uh, Estonia is kind of a leader in putting government services online, which is the reason why they have, uh, why e-residency kind of makes sense for them. I mean, I, I'm a little skeptical that uh, it's going to um, redefine the nature of citizenship uh, in any kind of real way, um, I've, at least in the near term. I mean, I, I have a short chapter on, on stateless people, um, and I, I talked with this guy who's been sort of stateless living in the U.S. for a while. He was um, born in the Soviet Union, and but, you know, has no uh, country he's associated with because uh, uh, he was uh, ethnic Armenian, born in Uzbekistan, and has a sort of complicated story and has become kind of trapped in the US. Um, I think we kind of live in a world where a person's rights are tied to the country they're a citizen of. Um, and it's sort of taken for granted that every person has to be a citizen of one country or another. And the first thing any government does when it wants to persecute one group or another, whether it's um, you know Jews in 1930s Europe or the Rohingya today is they deny that those people are citizens. They kind of define them as, as foreigners, say that they're not, you know, part of this nation state. And so I think that, uh, you know, as, as long as we live in a world where, you know, civil and political rights are tied to the citizenship, it's going to be difficult for, you know, something like e-residency to kind of uh, operate at that same level. And I imagine the question of what the obligations are to this state or this country, uh, because you can see how you would get privileges and, and rights, but really, how do you serve in an e-military? Uh, maybe you do that online and uh, do cyber I'm uh, hoping I don't get drafted. I, I read the fine print. <laughs> yes. Make sure that I, I don't have to pay taxes or uh, uh, fight in Estonia's wars. I spoke the other day, I, it was after I wrote the book, but I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed the uh, president of Asgardia, which is the world's first space nation, uh, which launched a satellite into orbit uh, last year and had this sort of uh, uh, very lavish um, uh, inauguration ceremony for him uh, at the uh, old Habsburg Palace in Vienna a few weeks ago. And so they're, uh, they're kind of thinking 
vertically in terms of uh, <laughs> how they're uh, defining nation states in the future. So who knows? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you, that, that one you can apply online too if, if you want to be. Okay. A and and do you need to get a ride from Elon Musk or from Jeff Bezos to go? He's a little contemptuous of Elon Musk. I asked him about that. He's like, no, that is a company. We are a state. So I see. So there you go. That's so the difference between Facebook and the United States of yeah, America. Yeah. <laughs> one is a nation, the other one is powerful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question here, and it, uh, it, it looks at uh, some of the things that you've already talked about, which is the changing nature of natural resources. You talked about how climate change is mm. affecting uh, nations' viability or even existence as a territorial reality. Um, we also know that climate change may uh, force uh, mass migrations from other parts of the country. In this, in, in this question, the questioner says, uh, how could increased demand for decreasing resources, primarily water, uh, impact changing borders? Would there be a trend back to superpowers to control natural resources? So a move away from nations, countries, more to natural resource empires. Hmm. If I'm tr if I'm asking that correctly, but I think that's what they're getting. Yeah, at. no, I, I I think I understand. Yeah, I mean it, it's worth noting in Kiribati. I mean people think of it, people think of these small island countries in terms of like the waves are just going to rise and the land's going to be underwater. But uh, really, the more uh, immediate threat to these places is freshwater aquifers, and they uh, that the flooding is going to uh, impact their ability to get fresh water, and that that's. Um, if these places become uninhabitable, that, that may be what does it um, before the actual land sinks. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's worth thinking. I mean, that there's some, there are scary reports out of uh, Yemen these days in terms of the shortages of water there and how that's uh, uh, driving the conflict uh, that we see. There's... Um, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, parts of India and the uh, kind of heat and crop failures that we're seeing. And um, yeah, I mean, that I, I, I don't want to go too much into predictive mode, but if, uh, if something is driving wars for territory in the future, it may be, um, uh, you know, competition for, uh, uh, for resources. In that sense, I mean, then that it may be uh, uh, fresh water more than uh, um, more than oil or the kind of uh, resources that we've thought of in the past. Uh, one of the questions is uh, a regional question uh, about Palestine. How does that measure up as a country? More than um, more than just uh, being a member of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, it. Uh, it or the Security Council, is it, uh, is it an invisible country, is the question. Is Palestine an invisible country? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't get into it in the book. I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, I talk about it a bit, but it, it wasn't kind of my, one of my main examples, uh, mainly because I feel like a lot of readers come to it with uh, some preconceived notions, and it, it, I kind of wanted to uh, focus on um, places that, uh, examples that maybe wouldn't be, as familiar to readers, but certainly a lot of the factors that I talk about uh, completely uh, apply in that case. I mean, it's it's a country, or it's a uh, place with a government um, that uh, is recognized by, I believe now, the majority um, of the world's countries that has observer status in the United Nations, not uh, full membership, uh, largely because of the US veto. And it does kind of face this kind of uh, questionable is it or isn't status um, that a lot of these places do and you know it's um, and you know I, in in terms of whether it's it's viable as a state I mean it's it's uh, uh, I mean my I don't really have too much of analysis to add to that beyond uh, what's fairly obvious which is that you know the longer um, the occupation continues and the more um, settlements expand, the kind of less viable uh, it becomes as a kind of nation state as we traditionally think of those. And uh, the more these kind of uh, more unorthodox 
notions of what a country can be uh, may have to come into play. Um, there's a question here about the European Union, and uh, the questioner says, you know, is a model. Uh, do you see it as a model for uh, for what may be a country of the future, economically united, culturally decentralized? Obviously, the EU is having its own challenges these days uh, with Brexit and with uh, Donald Trump. But other than that, I mean, do you see it as as a potential for creating a political and uh, a political entity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are uh, a sort of potential for more uh, kind of, uh, and the European Union is one, it, if, if I can take the question in a little different direction, yeah. there's, uh, when I was in Kurdistan, one thing, one idea that you kind of hear from both Iraqi and Syrian Kurds is this idea that rather than having a fully independent nation state, that there could be a kind of confederation where the uh, Kurdish regions in the four, the four main countries that have Kurdish regions, which are uh, Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey, that uh, those places would have kind of federal status within those countries, as well as a kind of confederations with each other, that there'd be a kind of, um, you know, sort of similar to maybe the United Arab Emirates, maybe that there'd be a kind of uh, confederation uh, between the Kurdistans in these different countries. Um, right now, I think the way that uh, uh, our, uh, you know, the international order is set up, it doesn't quite uh, make room for arrangements like that, at least uh, not with any kind of, you know, official international standing. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, whether it's uh, things like the EU or, um, kind of closer alliances or partnerships either between existing nation states or between subnational groups that I, I think there is sort of room for, uh, and when I talk about um, more creative notions of what a country can be, that's, that's kind of what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, the question here from uh, Steve Dahl is, uh, what are the key determinants of cartographic stasis? Uh, was there a global shift in something that caused this situation mm. in the 21st century? And as, as I recall in the book, you blame everything on Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> uh, I do get it. I do kind of go after him a bit. Um, so there were, I mean, obviously the main sort of period of country creation, the kind of the real like springtime of nations was uh, the uh, wave of decolonization uh, uh, that swept you know, Asia and Africa primarily uh, after World War II. And I, and I think there was a kind of global consensus that uh, the time of overseas empire had come to, um, uh, come to pass and that places that had been colonies uh, should be independent uh, states. But uh, that didn't mean that once they became independent states that there should be further territorial adjustments. And one thing I find fascinating is you, if you look at the African Union, uh, which is a nation whose charter says a lot about, you know, rejecting the legacy of colonialism, uh, the charter also contains language um, saying that there should be no further adjustments to borders as they existed upon independence. And uh, so it's, it's a bit of a contradiction. I mean, what could be a larger vestige of European colonialism than the actual shape of the countries um, that were uh, drawn in Europe for the most part. But, you know, it makes sense that kind of existing political nation states don't want to uh, open the floodgates to territorial adjustments and the kind of multilateral institutions, whether it's the a AU or the EU or the UN, you know, all kind of have, um, uh, uh, sort of institutional language, um, discouraging territorial adjustments. The U.S. has generally, uh, and with some exceptions, the main ones being Kosovo and South Sudan, but has generally kind of frowned on secession movements. If you look at, um, you know, the independence of Bangladesh or or uh, the Biafran War, the, the U.S. generally kind of uh, was on the side of keeping those countries uh, as they existed. Um, and so you have kind of 
the kind of major um, powers in the world kind of frowning on adjustments and wanting to keep the map of the world the way it is. And But it's interesting, like if you look at um, a lot of international relations scholarship from the early 90s, from right after the breakup of the Soviet Union, right after the wars in Yugoslavia, there was an ex kind of an assumption that that was just going to keep happening, that uh, every, you know, that Tibet and Kurdistan and all these places, all these um, uh, sort of uh, uh, ethnic groups with national as aspirations were going to just carve out their own territories. I think people assumed that that was going to happen and it was going to be this major source of destabilization going forward, but it didn't quite happen that way. I mean, it, as I say, you know, there's, um, you know, since that period, there have only, only been three uh, newly independent countries in the 21st century that have gotten to uh, UN member state status, which is uh, Montenegro, um, East Timor, and South Sudan. And some would say that the, those countries are actually kind of cautionary tales of what happens uh, after places become fully independent. Right. Well, I used to live in the Soviet Union, and I was there on Christmas Day when it was no longer the Soviet Union uh, in 1991. Wow. And in fact, that was how we felt. I, it, we, being many of the correspondents who were covering the breakup of, uh, of these regions, I also covered the war in Yugoslavia. Yeah. And so uh, was uh, had a front row seat on some of the violence that occurs in, in when these borders are challenged and when uh, new nations are in formation, as mm. it were. And so, um, uh, you yeah, know... And, and, and yes. going back to the uh, what I was saying about the U.S., I mean, I think people forget that there was uh, a lot of skepticism in the Bush the first Bush administration about the breakup of the Soviet Union. I mean, I think we, uh, for all we talk about, uh, you know, the U.S. winning the Cold War, I think there was a lot of wariness about uh, the destabilization that would happen if the Soviet Union broke up. I mean, the, uh, President Bush gave his famous Chicken Kiev speech uh, in Ukraine saying that we shouldn't, I think it was, you know, replace um, authoritarianism with local despotism. I, I'm getting the phrasing wrong, but right. um, it was, um, there wasn't overwhelming enthusiasm in the US for the idea that all the Soviet republics should be independent uh, e even at that time. No, that's right, and in fact, the same President Bush called uh, Gorbachev ahead of time mm -hmm. to tell him to warn him, in fact, that there was a threat to the Soviet Union, a potential breakup of that Soviet Union. Mm. Um, and of course, uh, it, it uh, took uh, Secretary Albright, who uh, recognized her uh, native nation uh, mm -hmm. and the opportunity for its freedom uh, from under the thumb of the Soviet Empire to really push for the independence and eventually the reorientation of those nations uh, towards the West, towards NATO, and towards the European home that she felt was uh, really their natural uh, orientation. Uh, you know, um, we talk, you talk about this a bit in, as a cautionary tale. The whole book is built to say, look, this is the world as it is today. We have this map, it's pretty much fixed, again, cartographic stasis and um and it's provided a relatively uh longish period of peace prosperity and stability with outbreaks every once in a while one of the things that i found interesting is you talked about um squiggles and straight lines and those are again we talked about this a bit earlier how some nations were carved up and defined but others just sort of follow natural geographic features or even ethnic and, and uh, linguistic features. The reason I say, I, I, I preface this all is you're talking about the current map and the potential pressures that are being put on it as a cautionary tale because you, without being predictive, suggest that perhaps this moment is not gonna last much longer. Yeah, and the, the sort of squiggly line thesis that you talked about, it's from a paper by um, uh, William Easterly and Al Alberto Elisina, who are economists, uh, and they have a sort of clever way of measuring the artificiality of borders, which is whether they're uh, squiggly versus straight. Um, so the, the idea being, uh, if a country has a squiggly border, 
uh, it's probably um, sort of actually corresponds with realities on the ground and was kind of uh, slowly carved out over time, or it corresponds with some river or natural feature. If it was a straight line, it probably means someone in a boardroom somewhere just drew that line. Um, famous example is uh, if you look at the map of Jordan, uh, there's the it kind of goes in an almost 90 degree corner and that's been nicknamed uh, Winston's Hiccup for Winston <laughs> Churchill um, that um, it was, it was kind of drawn in pencil one day. And, uh, you know, and while, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I talk about the reasons, the kind of benefits of this period of stasis we've had, I mean, clearly uh, the artificiality of borders has been a driver of conflict in in the Middle East and Africa and and in, in Europe even um, and uh, and it hasn't always served uh, the people who've lived within those borders well. So it's it's uh, it's an almost kind of um, uh, trap we found ourselves in, uh, and a lot of it just has to do with path dependency, where you know clearly uh, you know the map of the world that we've uh, live in today may not be ideal, uh, but, you know, it's, it, we've come to, to decide that, you know, changing it would be just too disruptive, that it's, it's not worth really um, opening those floodgates. Well, um, this person has a question here to change the subject a little bit. Sure. And uh, you've recently been covering uh, the, uh, President Trump and Putin's recent meeting in Helsinki. Um, and he asks, or she asks, what kind of effect can it have on a nation where the leader doesn't seem to represent the nation entirely and, uh, and uh, perhaps even takes on some of the perspective of another nation? Hmm. Um... Huh. It's an interesting question. I mean, it's uh, I have written about it. I mean, and uh, uh, I guess I would say it's probably not relevant from a uh, the cartographical uh, <laughs> standpoint. Okay. That uh, the uh, I mean, it's it the idea that I mean, if you uh, look at the world today, I mean, there's uh, no lack of uh, countries where uh, the leaders don't represent the will of the people who live under them, or at least don't have uh, democratic legitimacy. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I talk about um, the current nations of the world as a kind of club uh, that doesn't admit new members. And, <laughs> uh, w you know, that, and, and that this, you know, all, officially at least, all these, uh, members of the club have the same uh, legal status, and uh, and the you know whether or not the leader of that group, that country, uh, represents the people who live there is not a necessary precondition for membership. If it were, then uh, uh, there would be a lot fewer uh, recognized countries in the world. Uh, I was in St. Louis just recently, and of course, anyone who goes there sees the arch because you can't miss it. Uh, the gateway to the west, and of course, uh, uh, the Jefferson Park uh, and, uh, and expansion uh, monument uh, before the arch, heralding the Louisiana Purchase and the expansion of the United States. Um, today, we are looking at the potential of Puerto Rico finally fulfilling its destiny, perhaps, and becoming the 51st state of the United States. We uh, nearly had a vice president of the United States who came from Alaska, which is a relatively new place, and we had a president who is from Hawaii most recently. I think as we look at all of these American geographic realities and looking at the questions that you raise in your book and how to interpret uh, geography, politics, and uh, the future of the nation state, uh, I think those questions become much more relevant. And, 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 I, and I thank you for writing the book and for opening my eyes and changing my perspective on, on these territorial realities of the United States. Is there anything you'd like to add before we close off the evening? Uh, sure. Well, in addition to those examples you just mentioned, I would be a poor uh, 
resident of the uh, District of Columbia, if I did not mention our, our own status of uh, having taxation without representation. So uh, uh, this is almost a kind of uh, invisible country where I live too. And I, I hadn't quite uh, thought of it that way until just a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with your, uh, with your representation. I hope you get your congressperson and your senators, um, or at least you become a part of another state, depending on how you prefer to go. Thank you, Joshua Keating, for being here this evening. The name of the book, again, is Invisible Countries. Uh, and um, this will conclude the radio portion of this evening. <laughs> anyway, but please, let me, let's just thank, thank Joshua for being here this evening.